go ahead and look. I hope you like what you see. Good evening and welcome to this episode of Real Horror vs. Real Horror. That will only make sense if you see it written out. This is the fourth episode that we've done and it's something of a fun collaboration project I like to do where we talk about a real life incident that inspired a horror movie. I am stretching this somewhat because Rope is not exactly a horror movie, but uh, darn it, it is my channel and we're just going to go with it. Um, here to discuss Rope is a man who's taken on all the hard work of researching the real life case that inspired this. TCG, how you doing? I'm very good. Thank you for having me on. This is, uh, I think it's our, it's our second one now that we're doing together, isn't it? It is. It is. It's you and Shrouded have got two films each. Right. I'm going to have to get me back on for a third. I'm not going to be outdone by that lad. Oh, I like the rivalry. <laughs> I'm up for it. I'm up for it. Um, yeah. Uh, so I thought of you for this because this is a very classic true crime thing. It's very down to earth. It's not not all that supernatural. And you've looked into that. Uh, do you want to just talk a little bit uh, just for a minute or two about what this was based on? So yeah, so this this was based on the uh, real life events that took place back in May 1924, where uh, two friends, a la, you could argue, you could argue lovers, uh, Richard Loeb and Nathaniel Leopold, decided that they would try to commit what they would call the perfect crime. Uh, which would involve uh, abducting and, uh, for YouTube's sake, uh, ending uh, the existence of a uh, a young lad by the name of Bobby Franks. Uh, these two individuals were very, very into the Nietzschean idea of the Ubermensch. Uh, full disclosure, uh, I am not well versed in Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche's philosophies or ideology or, or, or as such, um, but I do understand that he has inspired certain people, albeit uh, Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche, sorry, he, he uh, disavowed <coughs> said person, um, and that his, his ideas have been open to misinterpretation, and this is another example of that. Um, these, these two individuals believe themselves to be essentially above anyone else intellectually and uh, um, and as such they felt like the laws uh, that, that man had produced didn't apply to them um, mm. what they didn't realize is that they weren't as smart as they thought they were so after carrying out the crime they were basically cap uh, they were basically uh, identified uh, as suspects within within 24 hours uh, and within a week, they were they were formally charged, and 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 what gave it away really was a pair of glasses that mm. Nathaniel Leopold dropped at the crime scene where they where they left uh, Bobby Franks. Now the glasses in question had this unique hinge on them, which uh, could only be tied back to three individuals from one uh, department uh, sorry one uh, opt opticians basically that would yeah. uh, that, that sold these this specific uh, hinge on these glasses and then once the first two people were ruled out it was pretty much okay we've got our man um, but there were questions because these guys were from affluent backgrounds uh, Leopold mm. came from a German Jewish uh, immigrant family uh, his 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 um, yeah I mean his his family were were very very well off um, and the area that they were from, South Kenwood, uh, in in Chicago, was home to people like celebrities, politicians, uh, you name it. it. It was the higher class. You know, Leopold had an IQ of over two hundred. Uh, some said it couldn't even be measured. Spoke uh, was fluent in five languages, but learned up to fifteen. You know, he had his whole future ahead of him. The same for Loeb. And they had essentially thrown it all away because they had this idea that they could get away with uh, with murder, literally. Mm. In your video, I, I really enjoyed the details of how they, they tried to set up their an alibi and the sort of complex scheme they used. So mm. Folks, I, I'm not going to spoil it now. Watch TCG's video. I think it will have premiered just before this one. So, And I really think you should watch TCG's video first to 
to sort of understand the background to Leopold and Loeb, because we're, we're talking about the adaptation where certain license has uh, has been taken with it. Oh, no. Um, w- very much watch the video. If you're, if you're here first, stick around because uh, we, oh, okay. we like the we want to keep the average. Uh, we want to keep the average watch time up because we want to get this out to as many people. We don't want YouTube thinking that this chat's going to be boring because it really isn't. No, no. I well, I feel under pressure now. Wow, oh, dear. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll go in with some gory details then quickly. Let's do it. Um, but yes, uh, so it obviously created a big splash. In five years later, it's adapted by a chap called Patrick Hamilton. Now he's a Brit. Um, fans of the old vintage movies might know him best for also writing the play Gaslight. Uh, great film, really great film, and that is where the modern term gaslighting comes from. Highly recommend it. So a bit of a powerhouse in the play world. Um, but obviously it's been changed then uh, five years after the fact in 1929 for an English audience. And it captures Hitchcock's attention. Um, he want, he then has it brought back to America, back to, you might say, its, it's actual home, its natural uh, location, um, when it's adapted for the screen by Arthur Lorentz. Um, and Arthur Lorenz, I think, also removes, he removes the English uh, aspect and really sort of brings it back to that sort of American one. Also, as uh, Lorenz is Jewish himself, I think he he brings, again, a bit more of that original context from the crime. Hmm. Uh, and it, it does it does feel more naturally American, I've got to say. Um, oh, absolutely. And it's... It, it gets adapted in 1948, so obviously some changes have to get mentioned. There is reference to a, a famously moustached uh, uh, postcard entrepreneur. Um, <laughs> you had to, you know, this is made in 1948. Oh, yeah. They were talking about Nietzsche's, uh, we, we won't use the original translation, the Superman concept. Um, they had to mention it, you know, what are you going to do? Um, and there is, yeah, there is a bit of Nietzsche in philosophy in that we can talk about this. Um particularly his stuff from Beyond Good and Evil. What they're really getting into is, yeah, that that um, the Superman idea, but also the idea of the master morality and the slave morality. And that itself is going to get a whole load of extra context. But you said this shouldn't be a boring conversation, so I'm going to quickly move it on. <laughs> no, no, um, no, no. I was loving that bit. Did you know this thing got locked away for years and years and years? No, I didn't. I didn't, yeah. and and as you, that, that on the one hand it surprises me, because this this film is 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 quite, I'd say it's, I'd say it's quite tame if you if you're looking for, mm. for 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 violence and stuff like that you you're not going to find it in this film, um, but I can imagine given that it was so close to post war, um, it was post war America say after the Second World War I can mm. I can imagine that the topic might be a little bit close to home but it just so happened that that both um you know the guy with the dodgy tash and uh, and the two individuals that it was based on both had almost like a warped sense of of this philosophy and um it really sort of i, I feel like was it his name rupert in in the film who plays like the teacher mm. i think it's james rupert stewart Cordell, yeah. yeah it's james stewart's character isn't it yeah. you know he he kind of represents that the not the idealistic version but the but i suppose i i would say like the true the tr- the true version of what uh, nietzsche was, nietzsche was trying to trying to get across like it wasn't supposed to be again from my understanding it you know if you if you take what what he was saying is it wasn't supposed to be something that was that was inherently you know you would you would use violence to achieve the, you know what what it was that he was espousing it was just sort of like a a, philo- a philosophical uh conversation that he was trying to sort of um hypothesize if you will um yeah and then you there's have... a lovely bit of dialogue where they're talking about this stuff and cordell is obviously making jokes he's mm. talking about the sort of the smart man's right to murder and yeah. he's obviously doing it in a humorous context it's quite weird to see jimmy stewart doing <laughs> such dark humor frankly yeah um but he's obviously got a level of irony about it, whereas you see Brandon, um, who's one of our, our two main killers, in fact, the lead killer, I'd say, the most um, uh, the most enthusiastic one. Mm. He is like a, a like a teenager infatuated, and he's just taking it fully seriously. He's absolutely, absolutely loving it. Yeah, 
definitely. I, mm. I would say, yeah, I, I definitely say that um, James uh, Jimmy Stewart's character Rupert was was kind of like the embodiment of Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche, mm. sorry, and uh, again because of how Leopold and and to a to a lesser extent Loeb uh, essentially idolised that philosophy to the point where. Low, uh, Leopold was absolutely convinced 100% that you know he was above all else and that the rules didn't apply and by extension Loeb was 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 in that same category um, but what was really interesting as well is is Loeb was kind of the driving force behind mm-hmm. the the sort of like the the, the the more lesser crimes to begin with um, but again, Leopold was was infatuated with Loeb, so you know he would he would sort of tag along. It, it was almost like Leopold was the brain, uh, Loeb was the was was the was, I think what they call the id. Yeah, you know, yeah, he he would... he's he's the more um, that from from your video, I got the impression that he's the driving force, really. Mm. Um, that maybe you could say the corrupting influence, although it doesn't seem like. All that much corrupting happened, but I wondered watching this actually. In a way, uh, do you, do you think Brandon and Philip, uh, the killers in this, based on the Apollo and Loeb, do you think they map across as neatly as like Brandon is Loeb and uh, Philip is? Leopold because uh, yeah definitely there there are there are very much similarities there so mm. Brandon in in rope is uh very much uh an extroverted type of character he's quite charming and uh well spoken um you know very confident um well presented whereas mm. uh Philip is very much introverted and 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 is quite awkward mm. and it, I would say socially inept I mean there's v- multiple multiple times oh, yeah. in this film i mean obviously you know given given what they what they had only done moments ago you can sort of see you know F- philip doesn't have the 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 social that the, the mentality socially to, to to keep up that facade where brandon on the other hand was reveling in it and mm. i think in terms of how uh, leopold and and loeb sort of lined up there there was that similarity so loeb was very much the extroverted type was very much uh, into his gambling and drinking and and and, conv- and cavorting uh whereas leopold on the other hand was very very introverted he was very socially awkward he looks mm. you know he didn't look um like a he, he wasn't i wouldn't say he i, I don't think he was convinced attractive in the sense of of, of, of uh, what a man in the 20s would, would look would look like you know he looked mm. a bit odd um people thought that the that the pairing of leopold and loeb was, was quite an odd pairing you know it's kind of like why why would richard loeb like nathaniel leopold and it's kind of like the vibe that you get from uh from from rope as well you know you've got mm. two diametrically opposed people in terms of their personalities and yet they are completely enamored and reliant on each other and that and that was the case and that mm. was the case in real life too i suppose what was throwing me off was that i felt that it i'm i'm probably going to bungle this so feel free to absolutely correct me so like loeb 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 had the passion and leopold had the brains i mean they're both mm. smart but and in this i i kind of felt like brandon got the brains and the passion yeah, th- and that, that would Phillip's be like, Yeah, he he's definitely got that introversion aspect, mm. but it feels like it was a lot more concentrated. So that Brandon's a driving force, which I think probably yeah. makes for a better film. To be honest, I, I agree. I, I I do agree. In in terms of the differences, that that I suppose that that's one area where where they would sort of differentiate. Um, mm. You know, again, not to sound too crude, but you know one of the things that that Loeb would would offer uh, in exchange for Leopold's assistance was um how how do we say it in a youtube friendly way favors mm, uh, Leopold yes. would personal go al- services yeah personal services there you go yeah so he yeah so so i mean Leopold was more assistance. than yeah, he was more than willing to, to to go ahead with it i suppose but but knowing that he was he was getting that as well because again mm. leopold absolutely idolized uh lobe in 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 that in that respect as well you know he was a guy who essentially i think personality wise was everything that that leopold 
wanted to be but but mm. but just wasn't and so he was absolutely infatuated with the, with this with this personality um and very attracted to it as well and so you know when leopold is sharing his ideas with Loeb, Loeb is like well okay well then let's go and i don't know commit a bit of arson or or break yeah. into a uh, into a university and steal a typewriter these are things they did um you know if you and if you join me i'll i'll do this for you as well as a as a thank you and uh yeah he went along with it naturally and when they were doing their petty crimes obviously they weren't getting caught for it which then only emboldened leopold in his own belief system mm. uh, but yeah going back to rope definitely if I can, you know you know i'm gonna have to put in a you wouldn't steal a typewriter <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do, 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 do. <laughs> i'm gonna have to do it but yeah, Sorry, you you're gonna there. you're gonna absolutely have no, absolutely do that, do that. Um, but yeah, no, going back to rope I, again, I don't want to derail myself. Brandon definitely does uh, have qualities of both in in that respect. He does have the intelligence that Leopold possessed, whilst also possessing the social skills that that Loeb possessed, uh, and and um, Philip's character um, definitely got the social awkwardness and uh, the I would say the unappealing aspects of mm. of leopold's character but you're absolutely right i think it does it does benefit the film um because that because the dynamic of leopold and Loeb was quite complex in itself and i think just sort of simplifying it down and, and and saying right this one person has these traits this person has those traits and you can have a very much a leader and a follower dynamic mm. um because it's very difficult to tell which one was really the leader with leopold and Loeb. because like i say they both had characteristics of both respected and, and and were attracted to physically and and uh, uh romantically I, I i guess you could say um mm. but yeah the, the the film does well to sort of hone that in and and harness it between those two characters quite quite uh evenly i think mm. and, a, and another addition to the film that i think is um i need a term for it but i want the my working term is screenwriter brain mm. um it, it's it, very telling of the screenwriter's mind that they have to put in basically uh, the leveled up version of Brandon. So Brandon is the the more the smarter, more charismatic version of the two, but he in turn aspires to be like Rupert Cordell, played mm. by Jimmy Stewart. And he yeah. doesn't want to be Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> and it's like that screenwriter brain that the super smart mastermind villains have to be brought down by an even smarter guy. Hmm. Um, which is kind of an odd one when in real life, you know, they're brought down by regular, regular, you know, uh, groundlings. And um, it's also interesting because something that Hitchcock does in a few of his films is he really emphasizes how it's actually the common man uh, tends to rescue the day. I'm thinking particularly of strangers of a train on a train here. Um <laughs> Where, which I really like. Um, it's it's just got this real touch of humanity to it. Yeah, that it's some like low level citizen actually is paying attention and caring, and ends up uh, saving the day. Yeah, yeah. We may think... end up discussing strangers on a train for another reason later in this, but we'll oh. we'll wait for that. Um, we should yeah. probably talk a little bit about how this plays out, shouldn't we? Um, yeah, sure. Because this this isn't this is inspired by Leopold and Lower, but it is condensed it is based on a stage play so you will not be uh, surprised to hear that it is uh, condensed into a short running time only 80 minutes um and it takes place all in one apartment we see the immediate aftermath of the murder we hear the scream as a uh, oh david franklin if i've remembered a character's name for once da no david david, david kent david kentley <laughs> darn it never mind um david kentley is murdered and the plan is to, in a, a sort of bold uh, refuge in audacity, to have a bunch of people over and sadistically serve them dinner and a nice party over the body of their son while he lies in a casket. And it, it's also part of a scheme, I feel, for Brandon to impress his intellectual crush uh, certainly intellectual, maybe more things um, mm. in Philip Cordell. Um, but it's, it's a very tight play, you know, it's incredibly condensed, but the same aspects are there. The murder for a philosophical purpose. Um, 
and also the sort of hero worship towards Cordell has been thrown in. The idea of the perfect murder and the detailed scheme that slowly unravels through attention to detail um, and just the story slowly falling apart. Um, it's all in there. Like the vibe of it is incredibly Leopold and Loeb, hmm. but the um, the actual facts have changed quite a lot. And some of the nastier aspects of the case have also um, been removed, but this got into trouble enough as it did for just showing a strangulation at the start. I can imagine. Yeah, definitely. Mm. I can definitely, even though it's perhaps if <clears throat> if there was one criticism I had of this film, uh, and it's purely only a technical one, I really didn't, I really don't mind. But I think, you know, they 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 end him, and he's still standing mm. up straight. <laughs> Yes, I, I yes, I very right. much that's, that. That's the only. That's to be honest. That's probably the only nitpick I have of this film. I think it's 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 possibly the closest thing to a masterpiece I'm gonna I, I, I'll ever see in my life. It was it was that good. Um, Your but no, I think it was an absolute beauty. I've got to say that I've been looking forward to this so much just because yeah. you watched it and then you're like, this film is so good. It was so good, so I good. I loved seeing that. And I and I and I I don't watch a lot of old like old old films i really don't and i feel like i'm really missing out on some proper gems here because um this this was it completely it completely blew my um blew my expectations out 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 the window it really did um but one thing i will say actually because the the interesting thing obviously about the setting is it is it takes place in in one room uh throughout mm. the duration of the film now obviously the real events uh took place uh over several locations if you will mm. um but what I think this film does is it brings in characters that represent people from the uh, from the real life events and puts mm-hmm. them in place. So you know, like for example, uh, Mr. Kentley, um, the, the the father of the of 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 da- you know da- David's father. Um, mm-hmm. I I I look at him and 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 think he kind of represents a a Jacob Thomas kind of character that uh, Bobby's father. Um, uh, again, for those who don't know, um, who haven't um, reviewed this case on my channel or, or elsewhere, um, in in build up to the um, date where they actually did what they did, they had actually started writing out uh, ransom letters because they were going to do kind of like a. Uh, I would I would say kind of like a MacGuffin hunt, really. Mm. You know, um, that essentially they were gonna. The, the it was it was under the guise of uh, ransom money, even though th- that was never the incentive. It was purely just to throw the police off the scent. Um, but what it did do was it, it gave Jacob false hope that his son was well, uh, when in reality, the moment that. Um, Bobby came across uh, Leopold and Loeb, and, uh, and and agreed to get in their car. He was he was gone within mm. within minutes, um, but it was all it was just all a ploy. But I think the the idea that they give him hope, um, and almost like getting the satisfaction out of knowing that that David isn't coming to the party, or in fact, because David's already there. He's just uh, he's just in a he's just in a chest um, that that they're eating food off of. It's a very sadistic move. It, and, it, uh... it is, and it's very, <clears throat> and I say it's very reminiscent of. Um, it's very like the the approach that the two real life killers took, um, because again they didn't they they didn't care they 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 took glee in that you know they knew that this this master plan of theirs was going to throw police off the scent and they, and they, they would never, they would never think to look for two Jewish um, German lads uh, from, uh, from, from the same area, you know, only a stone story. Like they knew Bobby Mm. Leopold, I believe was uh, Bobby's cousin, if I remember correctly. So, you know, this was a family member that, Mm. that had been, that had been taken, but they would never think about that because why, why, why would two affluent individuals need, $10,000. $10,000. They don't need that. They've got their whole lives ahead of them. It must be some ruffian on the other side of Chicago. Yeah, and and you you did the inflation calculation in your video, didn't you? So that was actually like 177,000 in today's money, is that yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, it was like it was 177 and a half thousand give or take. Now, oh, like... don't you love fiat currency? <laughs> 
Ooh wee. <laughs> Brutal. Yeah, big time. Yeah, as you say, it, it throws them off. Um, interesting. The the whole thing about the the MacGuffin trail. I love that that phrasing of it. Um, rem- reminded me of our favourite sort of um, ultra luddite uh, cabin dwelling uh, quadratic equation aficionado, Mister Ted Kaczynski, <laughs> and his just leaving trails of breadcrumbs that went yeah. nowhere. Uh, and, and this was the same here, you know, you, they're going to do all of these steps. And I mean, Jacob, bless his heart, you know, he got so flustered that he forgot where to go at one point, but uh, which, which basically threw a, threw a spanner in the works for, for the two, for the two lads in real life. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> but again, it's like these little things again, you know, something like that, for example, um, you know, th- there's little moments in, in the film where, Brandon has it all planned out. It's all planned out. You know, everything is is set to a to a timer, and there's moments where things don't quite go the way that he predicted it would go, hmm. and and then like Leopold Loeb, it was a case of okay, well, what do we do? How do we? Um, let's just rejig the plan slightly, or, or or continue and press ahead, which is which is what they did. So again similarities albeit in a different setting yeah you get there was a rule i heard about filmmaking um if they explain the plan to you it will fail oh absolutely which is i can't unsee that now that Mm. i i see that that's a cast iron rule Mm. um they don't really give you the plan here but as you said uh brandon just seems like he needs to one-up it Mm -hmm. He's not satisfied with the killing. That's not enough. He needs to actually intensify it. Now he has to serve them dinner over the son's body in the chest. He needs to just constantly up the ante and make it more extreme. He Mm. needs to goad the guests together who he knows will be socially awkward around each other. Um, He has to invite the one person who, who intellectually is on his level, if not above him. Yeah, he needs in, to beat him in some yeah, way or yeah. just sort of win his affection, maybe mm-hmm. show him. I think on some level he wanted to win uh, Rupert over and have him say, oh, absolutely, you're worthy of me, my boy, yeah. or something. Mm. Um, because of the, the history uh, that they had where they felt that Cordell had that philosophy, that Nietzschean philosophy, Um I might just quickly talk about that if you want. Just let's yeah, go for it. That. Please do, yeah. So, cheers. So people will be familiar. And, you know, Nietzsche isn't my thing. I know a very basic level. But um, they'll be talking about the ideas of the Ubermensch and um, master morality and slave morality. And that is a Nietzschean idea that you don't have a flat level of morality. You have ethics that are derived from your situation. So the example would be um, the sheep would say that predation is awful and everyone should just eat the grass. You know, it's terrible. But the wolf would uh, praise strength and uh, being an excellent hunter. So your morality would change completely. Your values would change based on your standing. Mm -hmm. And this is an idea that's, you know, People would associate this as a very right-wing idea, but it's also seen very much in left-wing circles as well um, via standpoint theory, as in, um, in its simplest form, you know, you think the system's fair because you do well out of it. It's these, um, the idea turns up in, in different places in slightly adjusted forms. And so in the case of rope, what Brandon is trying to do here is say that the rule, the common laws are made for the common man and that as an intellectually superior being, he's able to transcend them. He shouldn't be constrained by it because they aren't made for him. Hmm. Um, And so he takes this as an idea to just murder to show he can get away with it. Um, And why not? He should um, kind of flex his ability here. Yeah, I mean, it's it's easy to see how that kind of ideology can be warped and, and manipulated into something mm. uh, more nefarious. Absolutely, um, because yeah, I mean, as like you say, in, in, not not the standpoint one, but the other bit when you were talking about the sheep and the wolf, it's easy if you mm. just sort of like a baseline. Everybody's the sort of at, at that sort of level, you can understand how 
the perception and and the the, the morals that that a creature well I don't say morals necessarily but you know the rules and and and, and what's good for you and what's bad for you uh, based on where you are in that food chain let's say mm. um, would it's it's a debate that goes on constantly you know yeah. uh, as how can i say you see it a lot in how much something should be regulated you know uh, people will be saying our oh, government stay out of this i don't need it i can make decisions for myself mm. and then a lot of people who maybe don't make as good decisions drive the pressure for regulation to mm. take the choice out of your hand I'm trying to. This is this is not a political discussion. This is no, just no, no. loving a film, but I'm just trying to point where the ideas are. It would be interesting to understand uh, Nietzsche's philosophy uh, in more uh, detail. Yeah, highly recommended. Beyond Good and Evil would be the books to uh, go for for that. Okay. Um, it's also nice that they've thought about it a fair amount, and you have um, Rupert Cordell kind of still holding that philosophy, but he seems to come out of it and say since he still very much is superior but he then sees himself as having a role of stewardship like, yeah which is quite quite healthy i think yeah i think i, th- I think the way that he looks at it is more of um is more of a hypothetical uh mm. view than an, than, than an actual one because you know it, it's one thing to say right okay under this philosophy i should be seen as xyz whatever but the reality is i i live in the i live in the conditions that i live in at the moment i know that regardless of what i think if i step out of line there will be punishment um so you know there are societal rules that whilst hypothetically i could argue that there are people that 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 shouldn't meet need to follow those rules the reality is we do and there is no avoiding that you know Mm. and he and he isn't the person that's going to make those changes but he will gladly share the philosophical um understandings of it so that i don't know better to, to maybe you know again better educate people but again you know as as with all philosophies they can be warped and manipulated and twisted into something that it that it never intended to be uh, as as was the case with with brandon and philip i suppose and you know to a more severe extent, Leopold and Loeb. There's so many aspects of rope that we could dig into. Um, Something you mentioned just a few minutes ago that I thought was a really interesting tangent was how Mr. Kentley uh, is there representing Jacob Thomas, Bobby Frank's father. Mm. And that bit where Jacob Thomas is so distraught that he just goes to the wrong location. And I thought of this in rope the way that Mr. Kentley is just He's an old man, he's a gentle old man, and he's so well-mannered and just shaken up by everything that you really feel the emotional weight of the murder in, in it. Mm. It's it's this great counterpoint to the sort of fun and intellectual games. Yeah. That you just see the dad there sort of getting slowly more and more worried. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting position for Mr. Kentley to be in um, uh, as a viewer, in particular, you know, you're getting the, on the one hand, you're getting the sympathetic vibes, for, you know, that you're, you almost wanted to scream at the TV, like your son's in the chest, your son's in the chest, like they, they, you know, these two have done it. But at the same time, there's almost like a, 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 a curiosity as to, as to sort of, you kind of want to see where it goes. And mm, uh, there's yeah. almost a sense of excitement because, you know, obviously as the film goes, it's going to develop and it's going to ramp up and it's, and it, there's almost an exciting vibe because, you you hope that they get caught, but you almost wonder what happens if they don't. Um, and again, yeah. I imagine these imagine these were the feelings that Leopold and Loeb were having at the time when they were carrying out their crimes. Because again, when they when they when they did what they did, they didn't actually have a, a specific person in or, or, or adolescent in mind. Um, they didn't actually decide until the day that, that that Bobby would be the kid. In fact, there was another two children who were potentially eyed up. Uh, as as potential victims, but they got away, um, which is also why the, the the letters, the ransom letters that were that were sent to uh, Jacob Franks uh, and and Flora, um, Bobby's mother, weren't actually addressed to anybody. It was like, dear sir, oh. because the, these were all prepped in advance. 
Um, so you know you're you, you're writing that. You, imagine being in the position that that, that Leo Hold and Loeb are, where they're typing these these letters out, and there's almost that sense of excitement. Like we know that by the time Jacob sees these letters, or you know whoever sees these letters, you know they're going to be worried. Is my son okay? You know, is he at a friend's house? Uh, or sorry, prior to I should say. Um, you know, the son goes missing, isn't, you know, doesn't come home for dinner, you know, well, is he okay? Where is he? Is he at a friend's house? Has he gone off to play somewhere? You know, they go out, they go look for him. Uh, they can't, they can't find him anywhere. And then they get a letter that comes through saying, that, oh my God, he's been, he's been abducted. But if you follow these steps, we'll return him safe and unharmed. And it's mm. like, you know, there's the sense of hope, like something's wrong, but there's hope that everything is okay and it can just be explained away or, or that, you know, a, a, a good resolution can come from it, which is kind of what you see in, in Rope. But mm. the reality of the situation in real life and, and obviously what you see play out in the film is that there is no hope. It's it by by then when when it when it's apparent that something is wrong and that maybe, you know, something bad has happened to, to their son, but it already has and it's already too late. Mm. And it's Yeah, you you're not hoping for David and you're you're not exactly hoping for Brandon and Philip, but you are intrigued by the plan. Yeah, and, and I think, uh, and I think with Leopold and Loeb in particular, they were, you know, I say this was a carefully crafted plan. So, mm. I, I imagine that they would have been very invested in it as much as what Brandon and Philip were. Or I, I say, I say more Brandon than than Philip in, in mm. the film as as the film progresses. Um, but certainly, they would have been very invested in seeing this thing through, not just because of the obvious reasons, but again the thrill of getting one over on the authorities the people who were supposed to be experts at catching the bad guys mm. the, the that 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 energy that the energy that they must have got from you know fantasizing about getting away with it must have must have been exhilarating for them and, totally. and and Hitchcock just powers the film with that tension. Oh, doesn't he, Jonathan? Uh, and, and and everything. Every GCSE student now is just being like dramatic irony, dramatic irony. <laughs> yeah, yes. but you see it. But 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 Brandon is the magnifying glass. You know, he, oh, he, he's the you know to to that. Every every little thing that goes according to plan, you just see him light up, and is he gets mm. great joy. You know, because he wants to get. Um, Oh, what was her name? Janet and um, oh Kenneth. I think uh, it is Kenneth. That's yeah. how I got it mixed up. Kenneth Lawrence, played yeah. by Douglas Dick. So, so I don't, I don't think we've mentioned them yet. But um, uh, Janet is the boyfriend of David, and Kenneth is the ex-boyfriend of Janet. And David, um, Br Br Brandon knows that Kenneth and Janet aren't on speaking terms and such because I think the last time they they saw each other they I think it was Kenneth who actually broke up with Janet mm -hmm. um and so they weren't on speaking terms but Brandon's plot which again just added to the to the twisted mentality of this guy was okay now David is out of the picture I'm going to use this party to hook uh, to get Janet and Kenneth to hook up together and in the same room as in David. in the same room as David, which was just <laughs> mental in front of Mr. Kentley as well, I should point out, um, you know, so it's just it's just twisted. And mm. even even at the end, when they all decide to leave um, and, and leave Brandon and Philip to them to themselves uh, at the end of the because the party ends abruptly when they realize something's wrong, mm. Kenneth uh, Janet still goes with Kenneth and uh, even though it perhaps wasn't exactly the way that Brandon had had it planned the fact that Kenneth and Janet were both leaving the party together was still a win in his view and he still took great glee in sort of you know mentioning to Kenneth I told you you wouldn't leave uh, alone oh, tonight yeah. you know it was still he's the one who throughout is making those little comments and as you mm. say just being exhilarated dropping little things that we know Mm. has a double meaning yeah and what about and what about the rope used to tie the books together oh well yes you've got that information from the very start you've seen that rope mm. and then you just have to follow philip's reaction oh. uh, when he sees that once again brandon has just upped the ante it wasn't enough he's had to accelerate and comes in with the the books were a lure for um, David's father. You know, come yeah. over and we'll show you these first editions we've got for you. 
and then he's just bound them together with rope and it's you know it, it just gave me the feel the fact that he had to keep uh in, upping the ante they'd have been killing again within a week oh absolutely. Like, this was not enough for him he he, no. he would be doing another one straight after um, exactly yeah definitely. there's an also that lovely shot where you take a side view and you're just focused on the chest and you're focusing on the uh is it mrs wilson mrs wilson Go- yeah clearing up the chest there's yeah. conversation happening to the side but hitchcock's direction has you totally focused on the chest and just you've got this tension because of what you know gcac english students dramatic irony is your friend <laughs> um I mean, Hitchcock was a big fan of it. Um, he's also a massive fan of just this idea, the plot based around the perfect murder plan. Mm. Um, I, with no spoilers whatsoever, if you liked Rope, then Dial M for Murder is absolutely the next Hitchcock that should be on your list. Mm. Um, very, very similar. A bit more graphic, um, but I, I absolutely loved it. Um Actually, speaking of the graphic nature of this, um, as I said, they, they did have a bit of trouble with this one. He had a few complaints for opening with a strangulation, which is, you know, the most graphic thing that happens in the whole film. Um, when I was watching this, I, I sort of saw a bit of subtext. I foreshadowed this earlier. Um, when they're talking about how the laws shouldn't apply everywhere. Like if you if you got the big brains, you should be able to go above outside the rules, right? Hmm. It really made given the complaints that were had about the violence in the film, whilst acknowledging the wonderful script and direction, it made me think that Hitchcock's having a bit of a thing here about how as an artist he feels constrained by the laws of the time, the Hayes Code. Uh I had I'm weak on my American film censorship, so I, I don't know if the Hayes Code had, had sort of faded out by 1948. But didn't um, didn't Hitchcock have um, issues with a uh, previous production company that he was with? In fact, am I right in thinking this was his first film outside of that? Oh, I... I could not tell you for definite. I know I... this is the first of a sort of. Um... New, he's he started a new run of films based around these really constrained sets. So I, I, uh, I was, four I, years I, earlier, he'd done Lifeboat. Yeah, uh, it's a good I, example. All cause I, cause in I, a lifeboat. Because I th- I think I read something, and it, and I think it might have been when I was when I when I first watched this after you recommended it. Because I looked it, I look, I think I, looked, I did a little bit of digging, but I know it was either that or when we were doing the um uh, the Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, anthology series oh, um, yes. videos but there was a I'm pretty sure it was either this or it was the Alfred Hitchcock program that we were watching but he had recently come out of a uh, a deal or a contract and essentially was mm. able to produce a film essentially with full creative um, freedom I'm sure it was rope I think you're and correct so... yes it's his move to transatlantic pictures yeah um Away from uh, is it away from Universal? I think it was. And, yeah, yeah. He he de- he goes to he makes a, a independent production company with uh, Sidney Bernstein uh, called Transatlantic Pictures, and mm. Rope is the first one. Yeah, that he does with them. Yeah, and, and essentially this this gave him full creative freedom, mm. and uh, it really shows. So if you're talking about constraints, oh yes. uh, within rules and and boundaries then what a what what a film to express your disdain for it <laughs> we have will. not even mentioned the fact that this is shot as real time oh of it, course um, which you know this is one of there may have been something earlier i don't know i mean when this was originally broadcast adapted as a live play on the bbc a couple of times yeah which is where hitchcock saw it mm-hmm. um you know effectively it just ran in real time yeah. And Hitchcock liked the idea. Of course, the beauty of it being all a long take is just the tension ratchets up and up and up. This is something Scorsese loves. Mm. does those long takes, so the tension just keeps going. But Hitchcock, you know, he slid a few cuts in there. And I, I was watching it and thinking some of the cuts were a bit arbitrary. And then it was looking into it, I, I found out that he literally had to cut at certain points just because... 
the film reels film could only do 10 minutes yeah it was um it was yeah i think it was 35 millimeter reels mm. i think and so no i think it was I, th- I think it was a bit longer than that i i, I read something like 37 minutes Oh, interesting. It might have been a bit. It might have been. I don't know. You could. You could be right. It could be. It could be me wrong. But I tell you what. Those transitions between um, re- replacing the the films were, were brilliant. Mm-hmm. So again, for those who haven't seen it, highly recommend it. You'll notice a few times in this film where they get very close to characters, like right up to the back, to to the point where the camera goes black because it's like pressing up against them. It's those moments where the film has been changed over, and then when they pan out. That's the uh, that's them um, recording on the fresh batch of, uh, of of film reel, which I I, I loved because when I heard that it was a one shot film, and then I heard about the limitations, I was like, well, hang on a minute, how did they do that then? And it wasn't until I dug deeper and I saw they did it like that, and I was like, I didn't even notice. A lot of them pass you by unless mm. you start sort of obsessively watching for them. Yeah, in and fact, then- I think. Yeah, I think when we when when I watched because I've I've seen it like three times now. I think on the third watch I spotted oh, another nice. instance of it. I spotted another instance, and that was more towards the end. I think where you've got um, Brandon, Philip, and uh, and Rupert. Uh, mm. This is right towards the very end of the film. Opening and, and the another. chest. That's right? it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, That's I, and a I missed one. Yeah, and I and I missed that the first <laughs> two times. Um, and it was when he did it the third time. I was like, oh my god, that's another camera. Ch- that's another real change. <laughs> They sneak him in. They have to yeah. pay attention to the details of this one. It's it's lovely. Um, we could take this in so many directions, but since we mentioned transatlantic pictures, I just thought I'd mention the whole thing about this film being lost for nearly 40 years, um, which is something I didn't know about. What? Yeah. 40 years? 40 years, almost, almost. So this is no 1948... Uh, there are a whole bunch of them they're referred to as Hitchcock's Lost Five now he got a little bit of heat about this movie Mm. for reasons, you know, not just the violence but some certain subtext I'm sure we can discuss in a minute Um, (laughs) I knew you were going to bring it up (laughs) yeah, oh come on what channel do you think you're on? you think you're going to miss your opportunity? all I'm going to say is, will you link the compilation video <laughs> in the description for people to go and see? 100% I will. <laughs> um, so anyway, this is part of a bunch of five films that Hitchcock bought back the rights to uh, with a rope because it is, it's his own production company. Mm. He owned the rights already. Uh, he withdrew them from circulation and uh, they were uh, bequeathed to his uh, daughter Patricia as part right. of her inheritance. And... Yeah, so they went off the market. Wow. Uh, they, they weren't being re-shown in cinemas or private. Maybe private cinema clubs might have done them, but we've um, got to remember, this is pre-VHS. So right. you just could not see them, and they went away in Rope's case from 1948 until 1984. That is was when mad. It was mad. I know. Can, it, it's so weird to think... Um, so the others were Rear Window from 1954. I can't imagine that not being available. Wow. Uh, Jimmy Stewart again, by the way. The Man Who Knew Too Much. The really? The Trouble With Harry. And biz- most bizarre, Vertigo. It's like wow. his, his biggest one. And it, he just he just took them off? Yeah. When, uh, yeah, the uh, studio did not own the right to them. Now, they got it back in 1984, Universal... Um, bought it from Patricia Hitchcock when uh, she inherited the rights. Um, She, thankfully, sold the rights back to Universal for $6 million in 1984, which I know, $6 million, it's like, it's it's a heck of a lot. It's a crazy figure, but um, you imagine what she could have actually got now. I know, yeah, definitely. I mean... That was on the cheap, right? (laughs) Yeah, I I feel like she got mugged off. Tell you what, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the old inflation calculator. So adjusting that six million in 1984 dollars uh, for the inflation, uh, it's actually 17 and a half million in today's money. 17 million five hundred sixty-two thousand. Blimey! Again, fiat currency, not I even s- once. Do, do you know? I still feel like she would have been shortchanged. Oh, 100%. 17 million for yeah. five Hitchcock movies That's... that you can then re- release as like basically a brand new product to mm. a, a whole generation. You think I mean, you're so lucky we got to see it. 
Yeah, I mean, six million isn't anything to 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 sort of scoff your nose at, but I mean, yeah, when you're talking about who whose property it was and the the value on that, I think you know mm. you're easily talking double, triple that. I think. Oh, totally. Wow. Totally. I I just hope she maybe got some uh, rights to a percentage. You know, mm. is hoping. I'm sure she did fine out of it, but still, you you do. You do think basically you want a percentage of these. You want the um, what what's the thing actors get when the thing is oh, shown on oh, TV? Uh, royalties. Yeah, royalties and residuals. That's mm. the word I'm after. Um. So uh, there is another reason people might not have seen Rope in the cinema, um, especially around Tennessee. I gather P- people looked at this innocent tale of a little murder amongst friends. And uh, they they said there was something nefarious in it. Can you believe that? Whatever could you mean, horror show? Whatever could you mean? Some people have it it on the brain so much that they say rope is packed to the rim with gay subtext. Can you believe it? No. No. Pity we couldn't have done it with the curtains open and... uh bright sunlight and we did do it in the daytime brandon how did you feel when during it i don't know really i don't remember feeling very much of anything until his body went limp and i knew it was over and then Tremendously exhilarated. I know, shocking, shocking. That there, there may be something there. And in fairness, Arthur Lawrence, who adapted this for the screenplay, um, he is he is a very gay person. Um, and as <laughs> any good physiognomy check will tell you, uh, the stars are uh, not not um, exactly disparaged from such activities themselves. Brilliant. Oh, you, yeah. you you speak of physiognomy checks. That was a thing in the actual trial. Oh really? Life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They 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 brought out the whole uh, Freudian uh, physiognomy, and uh, <laughs> there's actual images of um, psychiatrists who actually conducted physiognomy checks on um, Leopold and Loeb. I am sure there'll be a uh, overlay that will be appearing over the screen right now as I'm saying this, uh, which actually notes the structure of uh, both Leopold and Loeb's heads and uh, the same key areas yeah it's 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 crazy um to, it's to sort not of... that crazy i mean, I mean if the... you've seen that study that shows that ai can predict if someone is gay with over 90 percent accuracy oh no <laughs> if, if you see five uh, from five different photos they, they have an over 90 percent accuracy oh, which blimey. you must imagine is the gift from heaven to schoolyard bullies <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, but I mean, we all grew up in the nineties. I mean, exactly. You'd yeah. have been rounded up for a gay check. Yep, yep, yep. Form an orderly line, you know. Yep. <laughs> Can you imagine nineties oh. bullies with that with that tool? It would be amazing. With AI, I know, right? It was. It, I'm, I'm, I'm getting, uh, I'm, I'm getting Friday the Thirteenth Part Four vibes now, um, <laughs> with that geezer and, the, and his uh, so called computer. Mm. <laughs> Am I gay? <laughs> Those what clips are going in. <laughs> yeah. Mom, I got 98 I mean, people have gone into a lot of details on the gay reading, obviously. It's there in the real life case. It's there in the screenwriter. And I'd also add in that Hitchcock has a little bit of a fascination uh, with, with gay folk. Uh, not the most flattering one. He really liked including them and he liked including the subtext in quite subtle ways in, say, one of the henchmen in North by Northwest who looks a heck of a lot like Brandon. And I, to my shame, have not checked if it's the same actor, but I don't think it is. Um, To cases like this, to Psycho, to also Strangers on a Train. Told you I'd reference it again. Yeah. Hitchcock likes a bit of a gay menace. He quite likes it. I I think if there was going to be a gay reading in in, in a Hitchcock film, this mm. this one would be the definitive one easily oh, again yeah ag- again he could just justify it by saying well did you know that when i looked 
into the history of this case, I saw that actually Leopold liked to play with uh, lobe stangly bits. <laughs> and so... Uncanny and disturbing. <laughs> in 1948, I couldn't exactly do that outright, so I decided I would use humour, wit and pun. And he did many a time. Beautifully. I'd, I'd suggest he's more blatant in Strangers on a Train, but... Um, well, hang viewers on. Viewers can judge for themselves. We, this is yeah, definitely funnier. I'm going I'm to challenge you. Well, I mean, I, I haven't seen the other film, admittedly, but I will challenge you if you're talking about how obvious it was. I'm sorry. The story of choking the chicken. Mm. <laughs> I mean, they, they kill him, and he goes limp, and what is it they're saying? I'll have put the clip up that the whole, how did you feel after it? And then, oh, they're, yeah. ba- they don't sound like they're describing. No, I don't think so. No. Yes, it's it's well done. It adds to it. It doesn't take over. It doesn't stand on a soapbox and proclaim an agenda. It is just beautiful fun subtext uh, great, from yeah. a character who absolutely loves to drop subtext in winking at mm. the audience and kind of rubbing his guest's face in it quite literally mm-hmm. some of the there was a little detail here at the end that i really i don't have a segue to this tcg i'm just going to drop it in because i'm just looking at my notes and no uh, making sure i can <clears throat> cover them all I'll, like talk to me about your favourite details in the rope because something I noticed that is now my favourite detail. At the end, there's a confrontation. Uh, Rupert Cuddle has sussed them out. Um, he's used his mega brain. He's worked out the whole thing. He's followed some clues. Oh, beautiful. You've seen the plan unravelling. He gets the gun. Uh, sorry. Brandon feels they've been rumbled. And so he takes a gun out and then Philip eventually gets hold of this gun in a tussle. There's one bullet fired. Mm-hmm. Then Cadal to get the authorities long goes and fires three shots out the window. I thought that's interesting. And I just thought, oh, hang on. He's counted the shots. He saved two bullets. One for Brandon, one for Philip in case they don't cooperate. Nice. I was, oh, that is such a good detail. Harrion would have been very pleased with that. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, okay. so many cute details like that. I know. Were, were, were there other things that stood out to you that you just thought, I love that? I love that. Like the, you talked about the transitions on the chest and. Yeah, for me, yeah, for me, it was mostly the transitions just because of the technical aspect involved. Because, I mean, you're, you're dealing with a very different uh, time when it came to filmmaking. Mm. And I, I, I was just absolutely enamoured with the, or I just adored, I should say, the, 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 the thought of it being a one-shot film. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, I, I just thought um, I was absolutely enamoured with the fact that it was a, a, a one-shot film, um, all, all done, not in one take, but, you know, if you screw it up, you're going to have to go back to the beginning and start all over again. You, I think you mentioned um, about the tension building up. You can imagine the actors in when watching uh, when watching this film as it plays out, knowing that one false move, one wrong uh, line, or or something like you know something along those lines would have would have would have essentially been hours of work wasted, mm. and then you'd have to go right back to the beginning and start all over again. So yeah, Jimmy that, Stewart found it very frustrating, I, um, I can, I especially because it's it's not just running the scene; it's the fact that there's really complex choreography. Absolutely, and the set is changing. Like just because of the dimensions, walls have to be moved. The chest would have to be moved at certain points so the mm. camera can get in a certain place. A uh, crew would take a table out so that someone could stand where the table would be. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, just... it's it's absolute feat of. Um, I want to say choreography almost. I, I, do you know, I, I, would, I would call it that. I would absolutely mm. call it that. Um, to, again, there's so many moving parts that are going on that you, the viewer, aren't, aren't even aware of. Um, this, is why I, this is why I call it a masterpiece mm. uh, because it's not something that you, re- that you really see nowadays in, in films. Um, and, I, and I have a real respect for... for, for 
for the craft that, that goes into it not just from the actor's perspective but you know the producers the, 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 the you know the lighting crew the camera crew there's that there's such a collaborative uh project and you know again everybody has to be on point mm. and i think yeah. it was even more difficult in those days as well again because you had the additional issues with with <coughs> things like the amount of uh with, with the amount of uh, you know film that y you could record in one go so again you know the, the the decisions to sort of like close in and then pan out from an object or a person just to give the illusion that the film hasn't stopped while a camera reel gets changed um it, it's just it's just beautiful i think i i watched this thinking that it actually does come across as a uh as a stage play first mm -hmm. and foremost but it just so happens that there were cameras there filming the uh fil fil filming it as it's happening yeah at the time just many stage plays were adapted for film it was absolutely natural to have that crossover but mm. it it just really works in this thing um it, it really captures the the spirit of the stage play mm. and i feel like you also like you said you watched it three times I, mm. maybe you'll agree with this but I felt like the first time you watch it, you're just entranced and you barely realise. Yes. It, it takes a while and you realise, you wait, this is all one take, basically. Yes. And then it's over. It's over in 80 minutes. And then the second, you just wrapped up in the story. And then the second time through, you're like, how did they do that? Mm. Like, you start yep. thinking about the practicalities of just how they got people in places uh, for that. Yeah, this this film definitely has rewatchability. Just because each each watch you can, you can you can essentially focus your attention at different areas of the film, mm. just to get a better understanding as to how how it all came together, which I think is pretty cool. Whilst also you know enjoying the story, you know it's not as if you can you don't have to take yourself out of the actual story that, that that's going on, but you can you can uh, sort of hone your attention into sort of different areas of the film and s just so that you can really, you know, as I say, understand the the, the process that goes in, that, that went into making it. Just, yeah, again, I, 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 I think I would have to watch it a few more times to, to really, <laughs> to really appreciate it. Basically. I, I think I, I couldn't recommend this highly enough. I am, surprised i'm not surprised given given the time it came out um but i think you know with other films that are around i i am surprised that it that it that it got the stick that it did in certain places where it wasn't shown like you said uh in in, in certain areas that surprised me somewhat it is very hard to put ourselves back in the mindset of that time of 1948 and remember mm. what the sort of sensitivities were of course like a fair old range of sensitivities, really. Um, yeah. Of what was permissible in, uh, well, particularly France, Sweden, and the US caused a problem for our British cinemas in terms of what you could show. Um, this was passed in the UK with an A certificate uh, towards the end of the particular uh, certificate regime when you had U, A, and H. And that meant that uh, you'd have to be accompanied by a parent if you were under 12, but Basically, everyone can still see it. Um, wow. But still, people did find it quite graphic at the start. Of it. The fact that you just open with that mm. um, throws people off a lot. But I think it's more the subtext that people had an issue with. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm so glad you love, love this. I mean, it's, it's... I'm not saying, like, all the old films are absolutely brilliant, but when... I just particularly love it when you show someone something from you know their grandparents day or their great grandparents day and they can still get so much out of it it's, yeah it's an absolute treat for me yeah i mean it's it's a film that really just plays to its strengths i think you know it's it's a simple concept um in in terms of i wouldn't say the production of it was simple I, in fact if anything I, i'd say that was perhaps one of the most challenging parts of it if you look at it from a technical aspect mm -hmm. um but the, the the fact that it that it really does feel like you're you're watching a play again at that at that time in that time period that is a good thing um yeah i just i i really really appreciate this this film um 
it, it's weird because obviously this was what 24 years after the fact um, but it's mm. like you said right at the beginning I mean we talk about sensitivities um, there was a lot of hoo-ha at the time when this when this murder did take place um, because America was kind of going somewhat through a, a bit of a cultural revolution uh, at the time um, I think you had prohibition in effect in some areas I think mm -hmm. in, that, in, that, in that time um, but you still had a lot of uh, excessive drinking you know in the old uh, uh, what are they called uh, speakeasies mm -hmm. uh, but you also had a lot of promiscuity going on around about that time as well and uh, you, you hear a lot of people these days talking about returning to, to tradition. Uh, we need to go back to X decade because that's when they had it right. Well, let me tell you, when they, uh, when, when news of what Leopold and Loeb did came out, the, the response was essentially, we need to return to the 1800s uh, because our society is getting too out of control. The youth are out there butchering each other uh and m the, the moral fabric of our society is is at an is at an ultimate low point um the the conversations we're hearing nowadays very much were conversations being had uh over our, you know almost 100 years ago when when this happened which was really really interesting um but then on the, but then you flip on on the same coin um you, you, when you when you flip that when this was all said and done and the trial was done and, and done and dusted, uh, what was it? Rope, the actual stage play, mm -hmm. was only released like three years after the fact. Yeah, yeah, done? 1929. So no, about sorry, five, five years. years, five years, sorry. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, we're talking less than, you know, half a decade later, the the, the culture and society felt, okay, yeah, it's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll turn this into a play. And that seemed to be okay. Not Sanitized a it a little bit, I would say. I mean, Maybe. The, well, yeah, got, I mean, uh, David is an adult. Uh, yeah, of course, absolutely. I mean, they, yeah, but yeah, they, they've sanitized it. Absolutely. But then even when you but then, you know, fast forward 24 years after the, the uh, after the fact, you then get the film adaptation of the screenplay of the of the stage play that was released five years later. And, you know, despite the stage play being all good, you know, we'll, 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 we'll happily or something that's still relatively fresh in the minds of people uh that's not a problem but we'll put it on a big screen uh for people to go and watch and it's oh oh hold on a bit oh hang on a minute gay subtext we can't be having that wait what's this <laughs> no 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 it just it, it boggles the mind how how like uh, over a short period of time you know the morals uh, and beliefs can can change uh so quickly I think it, it tread very carefully in uh, decisions like the sensitivity shown to David's father and how much it affected him, mm. I think really helps. And but of course, folks need to watch your video on it to to really understand the full case history so they can get the the, the full story, mm. right? Oh, absolutely. Why not? How's Why? that for a smooth segue? Boom, boom. I <laughs> love it. But yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, definitely go check out my full, uh, the, the full video. Uh, links will be in the description. And uh, yeah, it, it was. It's it's interesting because it's it's dubbed the crime of the century, but it's. It really isn't. I I wouldn't even say it's anywhere close to the. <clears throat> that it's anywhere close to kind of like the, the the most horrific story that that we've covered it's when 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 it's referred to as the crime of the century there's almost a a tinge of sarcasm in it because these people really did believe that they were gonna carry out literally just that get away with it sail off into the sunset presumably do more who knows um because they were actually, you know, despite having such high IQs, despite having such um, promising futures, they absolutely ruined it all because of schoolboy errors, essentially. And in a way, Rope is kind of a tragic tale in that regard, mm. because you've got Brandon and Philip, who, again, they're literally in the same boat 
as as Leopold and Loeb in that regard. In fact, in the film, if I remember correctly, you know, that the party is, uh, is is for Philip because he's going away, um, traveling, I believe it is, or, or something along those yeah, lines. Yeah, he's going to which, be performing. Yeah, which similarly, Le- Le- Leopold at the time was supposed to be traveling uh, across Europe. He was he was planning to go across to travel across Europe. I don't know if Loeb was going with him or not, um, but that was before he was to start uh, university. Um, mm. You know, he 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 had a hugely promising career. I mean, as a as a teenager, you know, he was um, he was really into ornithology, and he had published pieces in 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 like ornithology textbooks. And you know, he was only nineteen, but people really respected the the, the work that he put into mm. those articles and and took him really seriously. You know, and it's it's tragic how somebody with that potential just absolutely blew it on their own stupidity and their own ego. Mm. And definitely, and and talking of tragedies, you mentioned something else about uh, Bobby Franks and one of his interests. Yes. Um, The debating, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So this is something that I didn't actually put in the video at the time. Um, I, I wanted to, I wanted to leave it, I wanted to bring it here specifically. So, um, Bobby Franks, again, was another promising young lad. You know, he was very athletic and into sports and, 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 and whatnot. Very good with... Um, uh, he was quite into tennis. In fact, uh, Leopold and and Bobby Franks were cousins. Uh, I, mean, not fir- I don't know if they were first cousins, second cousins, but they were related in some way. And re- some sources say that they would play tennis together or, or he and Loeb would. I, I forget which one. But mm-hmm. um, one of the things that uh, Bobby also used to like doing was was taking part in the uh, was taking part in a debate club. And he would regularly debate students that were older than him on all ranges of topics, philosophical, political, you you name it. And he was very, very good at debating. And uh, I think it was about three weeks before um, his death, um, he debated uh, on the topic of the death penalty. And he argued successfully against it which um, was quite a, a cruel twist of uh, twist of fate as Leopold and Loeb would actually escape the death penalty at their, in their trial thanks to a, um, a solicitor or a lawyer by the name of Clarence Darrow who was oh. very renowned for uh, defending... He was a staunch advocate against the death penalty. Um, he lost one case years before he took on this case and he vowed never to lose another one many called him uh, the uh, attorney for the damned or, or the lawyer for the damned because he would often take on uh, cases like uh, potential death penalty cases and, and, and successfully argue against them um, but he mostly represented people in like poorer communities which was odd when which was strange when uh, Leopold's uh, sorry Loeb's family approached uh, Darrow and asked uh, him to represent their boys um you know because he was he he wasn't from the same cloth he wasn't cut from the same cloth as, as these two in fact there's pictures where you've got leopold and Loeb dressed all smartly in court and then you've got darrow sort of in between them looking all disheveled and it looked like he'd had a bit of a rough night if you if you catch my drift i'm just um, gonna put it here clarence darrow deeply yeah, subversive deeply Ooh. subversive indeed but many people thought that he uh he, he'd sold out by basically representing these two when when in fact his real motive was uh, according to him at least at the time was that if he can get these two off the death penalty then essentially it would uh cement his it would cement his legacy and then he could go on and then you know advocate for like a nationwide ban of the death penalty if you don't want to watch my video and why would you not if you want a more detailed uh run through of the actual trial you should check out the casual criminalists uh, coverage of this particular case because they go into detail of the trial um, and it's really, really interesting because uh, the, the guy that Darrow's up against, the, the, the state, is a guy called uh, Robert E. Crow, and he had actually... Th- th- these two were, like, considered enemies, if you will, like arch rivals, you know, mm. kind of like... You think of, like, the final boss in Yu-Gi-Oh!, <laughs> In, you know, kind of like that funny... hide to uh, Darrow's eye doves, right? it, it, Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and when when Crow found out that um, Darrow was going to be defending these boys, you know, he pulled out all the stops to try and 
uh, get the conviction that he that he so desperately wanted to get. We're talking over a hundred witnesses. We're talking mm. going into massive detail about the crime, really emphasizing the the, the, the brutality and the violence of it. Um, you know, but then Darrow came out and said, "Right, well, these boys are going to plead guilty, so no trial by jury. I've just got to convince one person now, which was the judge, which completely uh, threw." crow for a little bit but he still pressed ahead and at the same you know in that same vein he 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 could focus all of that evidence and testimony and right at the judge whereas darrow was more um very sort of um is it pathos the emotional side yeah playing to pathos yeah 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 he very much played to that effect and, and and sort of expressed the virtues of mercy uh which ultimately paid off, although the judge would go, uh, that's not why I'm doing it, but we're, we're, it's up in the air, I think. All right, I will put a recommendation, a link for that in as well. Uh, but obviously, so we'll put in a link to the Casual Criminalist video uh, in the description, but obviously people are going to watch yours first um, before they go anywhere near that. Hell yeah. All right. Do it. Well... I think that is probably everything on rope. I, I mean, we could have like three hours if we wanted to do. We oh try God. and do these a little more concise. Um, I've I really love doing the real v real. It's it's so much fun, and we do have a long list of uh, other things we could look at for that. Oh, I, I honestly, this was such a joy to watch, and you you know I've been desperate to have this conversation, so I'm <laughs> yeah. so glad that we've had it now. <laughs> Oh, that's brilliant. There, I I just want to hear your take on Dial M for Murder. One after this, I want to. I've just got to know what you think about that one because I think it'll be right up your street. And that recommendation goes for anyone else. If you watched Rope, if you like this, dip your toe into some more Hitchcock. Um, and Dial M for Murder is a great place to start. But yeah, I believe that's everything. Love doing these. More to come. Obviously, folks, go watch TCG's video. He has done the real life side of this. It'll be on his channel. Link is in the description. And uh, drop him a subscription as well. You you know, he's my co-host on my weekly stream on Thursdays. If you want to see us talk about a horror movie in more depth and actually talk about a horror movie, I have bent the rules a tiny bit to cover rope. But gosh darn it, I am not ashamed. Rope is amazing. It's our, it's our Nietzschean philosophy. The rules don't apply to us. That is the perfect note to end this on. Um, but we are on YouTube, so I have to get the shills in. Obviously, you know how this works. Uh, if you like this, do subscribe to the video. Do leave a like if you've appreciated it. And if you want to go a little step further, if you, you aren't sated by doing that, then uh, you can support the channel via memberships here on YouTube or on Subscribestar. Um, and that'd be much appreciated. Um, but that is all from me. So I'll be signing off with thanks, y'all. Cheese. Take care.